the lesson on Holy Spirit. Uh, this is lesson 10. Yeah. Lesson 10. And uh, we are just really feeling the power of the Spirit as we teach these classes. And, and I believe that as the teacher, Cheryl, uh, has been in relationship with the Word of God concerning Holy Spirit, uh, felt the power of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit working as we have gone through these lessons. Uh, and today's going to be no different. We uh, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for letting us be part of your uh, life of, of coming into your home, into your workplaces, uh, and just sharing what God's taught us and allowing us to speak into your life. The words that I speak, Jesus said, are spirit and life. And he's speaking through us. He's speaking through Cheryl. And I believe you are receiving spirit and life as you receive the word of God. We're going to pray and I'm going to turn, turn it over to Cheryl and she's going to get right into the word today and we believe God's going to do some mighty things in the midst of us. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you, Lord, for anointing Cheryl today, anointing uh, me, anointing us together uh, as this team, as we go into the Holy, uh, talking about Holy Spirit. And God, we thank you, Lord, that you move by your Spirit, God, on every person listening. Let him that hath an ear to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying unto the churches. And Father, we thank you for it today. We thank you for the power of the Spirit and what you're doing uh, in us, through us, and in the body of Christ. And we give you glory. We give you praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen, Cheryl. Looking forward to the lesson today. And uh, uh, I believe that uh, you've got something good for us. And we're going to just see what the Holy Spirit will do. All right. Well, hi, everybody. Um, we're going to kind of pull together some thoughts here and um, I called this recap so uh, something that I think is very important for us to realize is that when Jesus Christ walked the earth in his physical visible body um, just like we do uh, he did it through the power of the Holy Spirit Amen. now I did mention this in some earlier lessons, but I want to look at a few scriptures that really bring that out. I think it's important because, you know, it's easy to say, well, Jesus was the Son of God, that's why he was perfect, and how he could do all these miracles, and such and such and such. Well, he was the Son of God, he was the Word made flesh, and dwelt and lived in a human body, but the scripture also tells us that Jesus laid aside all of that in Philippians. You can read about that. And so when he walked in his body on earth, he was walking the same way we do, by the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's look at Isaiah 42.1. Um, <clears throat> these, these first couple of scriptures are Old Testament scriptures. They are prophetic scriptures talking about Jesus. So it says, Isaiah 42, 1, Behold my servant, that is, look upon and gaze upon intently, my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. So this is one scripture that clearly says, I have put my spirit upon him. That's the Father speaking. And um, he calls Jesus a servant. That's interesting. He doesn't say my son right here. He calls him a servant because Jesus came to serve. He told us that himself. But uh, the Father says, I've put my spirit upon him. He also says, in whom my soul delighteth. We ended... Uh, lesson number nine was talking about God as our Father and the love of God. Do you know that God delights in us the same way he delighted in Jesus? The scriptures tell us that. Um, that might be a good study. If you have a problem with understanding that, look at what God has to say about us. I think we've done some lessons, to, or at least brought that in in some other lessons. But today, we're talking about how Jesus 
lived and moved and had his being by the power of the Holy Spirit the same as we do. Isaiah 11, 1 through 5. I love this set of scriptures. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Now listen to this. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of might, the Spirit of knowledge and the spirit of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, Remember, he was the Word made flesh. He will smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Do you remember when Jesus preached a lot of times? It says that he cast out spirits by a word. Well, this is what all this is talking about. That's how he slayed the wicked. That's how people could get free of demonic forces, by those powerful words. Roger said it in our last lesson, that Jesus said, My words are spirit, and they are life. And his spirit could overcome any other spirit that was not of God and produce life in someone who listened and who received what Jesus had to say. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. This is such a beautiful description of Jesus. Um, all of these different things that talk about the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, and so forth and so on. These are things that the Holy Spirit was in Jesus. These are things that Holy Spirit is in us. Uh, Paul wrote in Corinthians that Jesus has made unto us wisdom, sanctification, justification, all of these things. That's what Holy Spirit does in us, for us. These are important attributes to have because walking through life in the physical body in this earth um, with a world around us that does not believe in God, love God, or love God's people sometimes. And we need the wisdom of God. We need the Holy Spirit of God to help us, to teach us. Um, remember how the Holy Spirit told Philip to go south and there he ran into the Ethiopian eunuch. Well, we need that guidance by the Holy Spirit. Oh, how quiet and sensitive our hearing needs to be to the Holy Spirit of God. If we would be still and listen, be still and know that I am God. He can lead us. He can direct us. He can help us through all the difficulties of life. He can lead us into the blessings of life and the enjoyment of life. All right, so now to the New Testament, Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. See, this is the same way. It's the same thing that God does to us. It says how God, that is the Father God, uh, anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Why did, he, why did he not just call him Jesus Christ? Why did he say Jesus of Nazareth? Nazareth was Jesus' hometown. That's where he grew up after Joseph and Mary had left Egypt. They settled in Nazareth. Well, I think... At least one reason for that is to point out that Jesus was a man. He lived in a city in Israel with his mother and father. But it says God anointed him. 
God anointed this man called Amen. Jesus with the Holy Ghost and with power. <coughs> Remember Jesus said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. It's the same power. All right. Um, Jesus used that power to go about doing good and healing everybody that was oppressed of the devil because it says, for God was with him doesn't say, for he was God. No, it says, God was with him. Now, does the scripture say God's with us? Absolutely. His name is Emmanuel. Uh, I think, maybe it was to Zacharias when uh, the angel came and was telling Zacharias he was going to have a son. Now, Zacharias was not a young spring chicken anymore, and Elizabeth wasn't either. Uh, they were kind of like Abraham and Sarah. They were past the childbearing years. But uh, one of the parts of the prophecy was that um, John would be the forerunner and, you know, God would be with us. And that's exactly what the truth is. All right, Luke 4, 18 and 19. This is actually stems from the prophecy in Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. But this is Jesus speaking. In Luke 4, 18 and 19, Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recoverings, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Do you know this is the acceptable year of the Lord? This is the day of grace. It's going to be the day of grace. It's going to stay the day of grace because Jesus paid the price for everything else. He took judgment on the cross. So we now live in a day of God's grace. Uh, the scripture says we can receive the abundance of grace. The scripture says that he is rich in mercy, that he has abundant mercy. Yes. Whatever we need, it's all there. And Holy Spirit teaches us. He gives us the understanding. He lets us know the things that God has freely given to us. These are just some of the things. Uh, God promised to supply all of our need according to his riches, not ours, not our hard work, not our slaving. You know, we can work all of our life, and unless we really have some profession that can really roll in the dough, uh, it's still not enough. But he's promised to supply our needs according to his riches by Christ Jesus. Amen. All right, anything you want to say? No, just tell me. All right. All right, so... <clears throat> Jesus promised, we talked about this, I think, in our, one of our very first lessons. Jesus promised that he and the Father would come and dwell in us. Uh, he said, my Father will love you because you love me, and we will come make our abode in you, or that is to make their home in us. That's what that actually means. They come as Holy Spirit or the Spirit of Holiness. Holy Spirit doesn't come and go. That's not what he does. He's not here today and gone tomorrow. Stays gone a week and comes back. No, it says that they would make their home in us. Holy Spirit abides within us. Now, uh, <clears throat> we might shut Holy Spirit up. We might cut him off and not listen to what he has to say. Uh, there's a lot of things we can do. To The scripture talks about don't grieve the Holy Spirit. We'll look at that in a minute. But we can just decide we're not going to obey God or whatever. And that causes Holy Spirit to get very, very silent. He will just, it's kind of like um, going dormant. You know, we have fruit trees and grapevines and all these things, and they have a dormant season where there's no growth, there's no uh, fruit, there's no nothing. It's almost like they're in a dead state. 
Well, this same thing can happen if we grieve the Holy Spirit. Let's look at Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. And whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, the good news of your salvation, in whom also, this is talking about in whom Jesus after we believed, we were sealed with that Holy Spirit Amen. of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Now, this is very important, and I want to tell you why. Let me get my phone up here a minute. This word sealed, it says, In whom after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now you remember, or might realize, we seal an envelope, but it can be opened and that sort of thing. In uh, ancient days, maybe in some countries still, uh, the king would seal something and he would have like a wax, there were all kinds of different, different types of seals. But a lot of them used a type of wax, and, and then he would put his ring and imprint that seal with his ring so that only the person, if the person it was destined for saw that seal broken, they knew somebody had gotten into that information. But this seal is similar. It means to stamp with a signet or a private mark. The reason for the stamp is for security or preservation, to keep secret. It means a lot of things, but it means to prove, confirm, or attest. To confirm, authenticate, and place beyond doubt. <laughs> and... I'm hoping to do a study on the seal because the scripture has a lot to say about the seal. And I'm going to be honest with you, I don't have the revelation of it yet. I don't have the rhema word on it. But what I do know is this. We have been sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. <clears throat> that sealing has been done by God through the Holy Spirit. And it is a place of protection for us. It kind of, when I was thinking about this, it reminded me of the verse in the book of the Revelation where it talks about God shuts the door and no man can open it. God opens the door and no man can shut it. I kind of saw this sealing in the same light. If God seals you, there's not anybody that's going to be able to break through that seal. The only thing that may happen is we can turn our back and say, we're not having anything to do with this. You know, we, we're just going to do our own thing and go our own way. But if we realize the value of the sealing of the Holy Spirit, that this is our place of protection and security. You, if you move, if a person moves outside of that, and decides that they can guide their own life and live their own life, then that kind of ties up Holy Spirit. That's when he goes dormant in us. Because Ephesians 4, 30 and 32 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. You know, there's a full redemption coming. The scripture talks about even our body being redeemed. Our spirit's been regenerated. Our soul is in the process of being uh, renewed and redeemed and brought up to the mind of Christ. But there's to be a redemption of the body. Romans 8 tells us that. If, if we decide to break that seal by going a different way than the ways of God, uh, that's kind of a dangerous thing to do. You might want to think that through a little bit. But now here's what he says. Verse 31 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking 
be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Now why does he put all this after the sealing and after don't grieve the Holy Spirit? Because those are ways that we grieve the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like two plus two is four. So we don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit by keeping these things inside of us. We want to have a pure heart so we can see God. We want to walk in kindness to one another. Don't you want people to be kind to you? I do. <laughs> I want kindness to be what dwells in me. Kindness that I can sow seeds of kindness in someone else's life and all of these other attributes. All right. Um, I think we're getting fairly close to time being up, so I want to just read one more thing, and for my part, this is going to conclude uh, the lesson on the Holy Spirit. And I want to say this. We walk by the blood covenant that Jesus Christ purchased for us. All of the things we've talked about the Holy Spirit is part of the covenant. It's part of the blessing of the covenant. It's a Holy Spirit that witnesses to us concerning the covenant that we are under. It's the Holy Spirit that can bring us into the fullness of the covenant. You know, there's many, many blessings in the Bible, <clears throat> many promises of God in the Bible. Um... Sometimes there are conditions with them, but this is the job, one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit, to make us aware and to help us realize this great covenant that we walk in. Jesus Christ paid a high price for that covenant, for us to be in covenant with his Father. He loved the Father so much that he gave his life because the Father so loved the world. So there had to be a blood sacrifice, and Jesus did that for us. Now, um, <clears throat> Hebrews 10, 15 through 17 says, Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I... I will put my laws in their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now why is that important? If God's constantly remembering our sins and iniquities, we're constantly going to be under uh, the death penalty. Because that's how it was under the law. If you didn't bring an animal sacrifice... Uh, to have forgiveness of your sins, your sins were not forgiven. But God tells us that Jesus paid that price. He's not going to remember our sins anymore. He's not the one that throws up all those old thoughts about bad things you did. He doesn't do that. So this is one major important reason why not to grieve the Holy Spirit but rather to value that precious spirit that dwells within us, to seek the way of the Lord. Jesus promised that there would be rivers of living water, and the rivers of living water are to bring life to all the nations, to every creation. The scripture tells us that over and over again in many places. So we want to keep our hearts pure so we can see the Father and hear the Father through the power of the Holy Spirit. We can be that channel of living water to other people who need a drink to bring them to life, to restore life to them. Uh, the book of the Revelation talks about the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nation. You're the trees of the Lord, the planting of the Lord. And uh, those leaves are fruit-bearing leaves. We bear the fruit, the evidence that there is a Holy Spirit in us. Not a spirit that wants to condemn people and belittle people and hurt people. No. This spirit is a pure spirit that walks in love. 
that wants to see people healed, that wants to see the brokenhearted brought back to life. No more tears, just joy in the Holy Spirit. All right, mister, you finish it up. Amen. You know, it's been a wonderful teaching as we went from week to week, uh, learning about the influence and the, the reality, the, the relationship with Holy Spirit in our life. Uh, I want to go to Luke, the 11th chapter, and uh, read just a little bit because this message deserves a response from the listener. Uh, because this has not just been about us. We could do a, own, do a Bible study, but it's been about those of you that's been listening and hearing, whether you've heard one lesson or whether you've heard them all. Uh, and you're saying, what is the big deal about this Holy Spirit? Now, that's just something the Pentecostal people or the charismatic people or whatever. No, it's for every believer. But in Luke, the, the 11th chapter, in verse 9, it says, and I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For to everyone that seeketh, receiveth. Now say that, receiveth. Receive. Everyone that seeketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, uh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Now I'm going to show you in a minute what that's talking about. Because we're talking about Holy Spirit. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask, ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he give him a scorpion? Now, what's that? Now, uh, he said that reassuring those with concerns. What if I receive that? You know, early in my life, uh, I heard people talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit being of the devil. It was in all kinds of things uh, that was just from a religious point of view. But whenever you ask, God's not going to give you something that's going to hurt you or harm you. But watch verse 13. He says, If ye then be being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Ghost to them that ask Him. So I'm going to, I'm going to give you the opportunity. I'm going to open the door uh, for you to ask for the Holy Spirit. Now, whenever you ask, there needs to be a corresponding yielding. Uh, you know, if, if you give a child or give somebody a gift, you expect them to reach out and take it, don't you? Uh, so that's what I want you to do is... As you ask God to fill you, baptize you, however you want to put it, uh, with Holy Spirit, I want you to reach out right now. Cheryl, I believe the Word of God deserves a, a response from those that have been listening. So right now, will you ask? Will you ask? Father, give me Holy Spirit. Father, I'm asking and I trust you not to give me anything that's harmful to me, but God, you will give me Holy Spirit. And God, we ask for Holy Spirit right now, and we deliberately reach out to receive. Now, just re yield yourself. Yield if, 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 you know, it's not my job to give you Holy Spirit, not my job to cause you to speak with tongues. If it comes with tongues, I want you just to let uh, your, your, your lips speak those words. And let God baptize you, fill you. Now receive you the Holy Ghost and let God move in you. And let God touch you and bless you, fill you with the Holy Ghost. And you watch a difference in your life. It's been a pleasure coming to you as Cheryl and I have been here. Cheryl has diligently sought the scriptures out. And, and uh, as we've sat together and let Holy Spirit move through us. To talk to you. We are excited about what God is doing in you. God's brought you a gift. Receive it and let it let Him make it real in your life. We appreciate you joining us today. Any final word? Well, I just want to say that um, <clears throat> Holy Spirit is a person that's invisible. <laughs> it's a breath of fresh air. 
And the speaking in tongues part, it will be your voice that speaks. But you don't have to make something happen. He'll take care of that if you'll just yield yourself to him. Amen. God bless you. Love you. And we'll see you next week.